Give me eight minutes. I am going to try to convince you that sea slugs are the most beautiful, fascinating, and perverted animals in the history of life. Let's go. These are uh, some examples of the group that I happen to study. There's about a dozen different kinds of sea slugs. My group are the ultimate vegetarians. They take vegans uh, to the pavement. These slugs eat seaweed. And instead of digesting their meal, their stomachs actually pluck out the chloroplasts, which are the part of plant and algal cells that do photosynthesis. And they put the chloroplasts in their bodies, which is why a lot of them are green. And instead of eating, they can then just sunbathe and their hijacked algae parts will perform photosynthesis and give them fuel and they can go months without ever eating again as a functional fusion of plant and animal. Right? So awesome. One salad, you're good to go for a month? Are you kidding me? <laughs> However, they do not get the press that their cousins, a group called nudibranchs, get, which means naked gill, and as the tawdry name would suggest, these are shameless media whores. They are favorite objects of underwater photographers because of their cheap, showy beauty. Um, <laughs> truly the drag queens of the deep. There is no, there's no reason for this to be this flamboyant and colorful in an ocean where everything is trying to eat you. Orange polka dots, really, really neon mesh racing stripes, highlights, are you kidding me? I mean, this is just shocking. Um, and so it raises an interesting question, which is how in the hell they can get away with it, right? Um, oh, this is a species, it didn't used to have a name and I found it in South Africa when I was a blushing 24 and new to the world, and I thought since I had discovered it, it might get named after me, but then it didn't, <laughs> which is fine. Um, this, I feel like if this slug were on Project Runway, Tim Gunn would be concerned. <laughs> it's, that's way, there's just too much going on. But you get the idea. If you Google sea slugs, there are thousands of images because underwater photographers love these guys. I think they beat butterflies, birds, and flowers hands down. They are truly, truly spectacular. Um, I don't drop the word fabulous lightly in conversation. <laughs> Bornella anguilla is fabulous. <laughs> this slug, it's, it's this big. It swims like an eel, and it looks like a cross between a Chinese dragon and the 1972 VW van my cousin followed the dead around in. <laughs> awesome. Um, so how did they get away with this? Well, there's two ways to survive in the ocean, and one is you can be fast like these little fish. Something comes, you swim away. But a lot of things like these sponges, soft corals, seaweeds, they can't move. And so all of these things fill their bodies with toxins so that fish and crabs will not eat them. Sea slugs have evolved a dietary superpower whereby they can actually eat things that are toxic to everything else. And not only do they eat these things, they actually store, they concentrate the poisons in their own body. So they can be 20 times more toxic than the thing that they ate. So now a fish comes up and tries to bite this slug and the slug releases a cloud of toxic mucus and the fish spits it out, right? Damn clever. Um, so this is a video of a slug doing a behavior that's the mollusk equivalent of, a, of an uh, agro supermodel tossing her hair and going, whatever, whatever. Um, Girl, I will shoot toxic mucus all over your ass. Do not mess with me today, whatever. Whatever, I'm out of here. Um, I have licked a lot of slugs in my day, and they are truly terrible tasting. Like, really, really terrible. I've been the guy chasing friends around, going, taste this slug slime on my fingers! It's so gross! Taste it! Um, we'll leave him behind. 
Uh, but there is actually a purpose to all this frivolity, which is that for many decades, people have been trying to isolate these toxins from marine animals and seeing if they have potential to kill bacteria, viruses, cancer cells, things that are medically relevant to us. And I'm very proud because one of the species that I actually study, oops, Alicia ornata, um, is a source of toxins called cahalolides that are currently in clinical trials as potential anti-cancer drugs. So someday, your life may be saved by a sea slug. Respect. Um, another group called Aeolids takes their name from the Greek god of the winds because they have these frilly projections on their back that kind of flop in the breeze. These bad boys eat sea anemones and jellyfish, and instead of digesting the stinging cells, they actually move them into the frills undetonated. So if a fish tries to bite them, it gets a mouthful of stings instead. I picked up a phylodesmium a few years ago to hand to a colleague. I just scooped it up and went, oh, God, mother, son of a... <laughs> 20 minutes, my hand burned like it was on fire. From there, hijacked stinging cells from whatever it was that they were eating. So these kids are not messing around. Um, and little-known trivia... Our own California sea hare, which is a very large sea slug that kind of looks like a bunny rabbit, if you can imagine a slimy bunny rabbit exuding purple ink. Um, uh, uh, Eric Kandel and his colleagues have been studying this animal for about 30 years, and they won the Nobel Prize in medicine for using these sea slugs to understand how nerve cells record experience as memory. So if you poke this slug once, it kind of goes, Wah. And if you poke it again, it goes wham. And if you poke it a third time, it goes wham. And then it ignores you. <laughs> Nobel Prize. And I kid you not. <laughs> now, it, it turns out that's an oversimplification, but... If you can understand how nerve cells actually remember how many times you've been poked, that turns out to hold the key to all of human cognition and neurodegenerative diseases. So that's kind of a big deal. Um, <laughs> the reason I'm highlighting the medical importance of these slugs is that I'm working through some early childhood issues because <laughs> my mother, pictured here decapitating a Christmas elf, um, never wanted me to be, to be a marine biologist. And this is the only thing I've ever wanted to do since I was a little, a little boy. And uh, every year we would go to the Jersey Shore for vacation and as we were driving past the fishing shacks falling into the bay, she'd push my little face up against the window. I'm four years old. And say, Patrick, do you see that? That's where the marine biologists have to live. <laughs> and then when... We, so sick. We'd get up to the oceanfront mansions and she would go, Patrick, see that? That's where the doctors live, <laughs> with their mothers. <laughs> she should have tried reverse psychology. Um, I know it's not right, but part of me really wants her to someday need life-saving medical intervention that stems from research on sea slugs. <laughs> right? <laughs> right. I mean, okay. So... That's all the filler, but what we really want to talk about is the sex life of sea slugs. It's just a few more minutes. Stay with me. It'll change your life. Um, <laughs> sea slugs are hermaphrodites, which means they have both boy and girl parts, and that might seem to you like the best of both worlds, but it actually poses some really interesting evolutionary conflicts. Um, some of you are probably women, perhaps? <laughs> I don't study mammals, but... Um, uh, I, have, I have been told that from a woman's perspective, getting pregnant, giving birth, and raising a child is a lot more demanding than the two or three minutes a man has to invest, <laughs> at a minimum, in the act of reproduction. <laughs> Ergo, it's just easier to be the boy. So imagine you're both. You can be whatever you want. You, you're crawling along, you bump into another hot and frisky sea slug. Are you going to get your rocks off and move on, or are you going to get knocked up? you're totally gonna get your rocks off and move on. You just are, if you can, right? So what do you do when everybody wants to be the boy? How you resolve that? 
It's a question. So it turns out evolution has actually come up with three to <laughs> what? Three what? Totally different solutions to this problem. Some species of sea slug mate exclusively by what's called reciprocal insemination, where in scientific parlance they adopt a 69 position. And <laughs> Each slug extends its penis and they both inseminate each other for the exact same period of time. It's a tie. <laughs> Conflict resolved. So that's one solution. Um, the second solution gets a little bit gnarlier. In the group sex solution, every slug gets to be the boy with many other slugs, which is awesome but then also has to be everybody's girl. <laughs> so this is a slug three-way, something you probably didn't think you'd see when you woke up this morning. Um, I'm circling their penises because they're transparent, so it's hard to see. So each slug is getting doinked by the slug behind it, and sometimes they will form daisy chains of dozens of slugs. <laughs> kind of a thing going on. And then they just swap it around. Um, and as if that's not shameless enough, our old friend, the California sea hare, dear God, Rick Santorum would be horrified. <laughs> that's just not right. These, uh, they form these outrageous mating aggregations that I don't want to burden you with scientific terminology, but this is called a fuckball. <laughs> yeah. Now, as if that is not bad enough, the third and final solution is the hit and run approach to love. It's a system of mating called hypodermic insemination. Tricky to pull off because the tip of your penis has to be a hypodermic needle capable of punching holes in your partner. But the advantage is if you can pull this off, you can actually inject sperm anywhere into the body of another slug with or without consent. You just have to be the first one to draw. Um, so this is one slug injecting sperm into another, and um, these are actually two different species, and he doesn't care. <laughs> doesn't care at all. So this is hard to see, but um, uh, this is actually a blob of sperm under the skin of this unlucky victim, and the sperm will now swim through the body tissues looking for the ovaries. But, um, yeah, he is long gone by the time that happens. <laughs> I actually study these two species uh, in San Francisco Bay, and every year, excuse me, every year when this species appears in large numbers, it actually screws this species extinct in San Francisco Bay. And these guys have to die before this species can get back, because these guys are smaller, and so they get bullied. It's really sad. Um, oh, I should also add, if you put like a hundred of these together in a dish, they form an immediate fuckball that can last for like two hours. And when it is, not that I watch, but when it's done, all the slugs crawl apart to lay their eggs every time one dead slug at the bottom of the pile. Big smile on his face, dead. Yeah. We all gotta go sometime. Um, so, you know, it raises an interesting question in some of these species, what happens if everyone's a top? How do you resolve that little dilemma? So in some species, their penises are actually as long as their entire bodies. They're incredibly flexible and they, if you watch them, it's like they have a mind of their own. Um, and so this is a little video of a slug three-way, and it's hard to see the penises because they're transparent, but they've all got their junk out, and they're all trying to get a stab in without a retaliatory jab because, you know, you, you don't want to get knocked up. So he's about to get in there, but now he's coming around. And he, oh, oh, yeah. It hurts. They're punching holes in each other, right? So 
this behavior is called penis fencing because <laughs> sort of like, come on, brother, let's go. And uh, you'll see, t sorry for the light, you see two things in a minute. One is he's getting stuck. He's about to execute a maneuver. It's very high points. It's, um, where is it, where is it? Wait for it. It's, oh, it's the backflip. Oh, yeah. And then, oh, you fucked yourself. <laughs> what? That is awesome. His, her kids are going to have a hard time on the playground. Your mom is also your dad. Ha <laughs> ha. Uh, and I will just leave you with this, just to show that slugs are actually good mothers when all the so sordid ugliness is over. When they lay their eggs, they lay them in these beautiful, beautiful ribbons that often have incredibly colorful ribbons of yolk. These are like cupcakes in your kid's lunchbox. These are the babies. And they get to eat all this yummy orange before they hatch out. And uh, also, I just think they're beautiful. So thank you very much for listening.